is La Plana, a picturesque coastal village located on Spain's southeastern coast in the stunning region of Murcia. Its idyllic location between the glistening Mediterranean Sea and the majestic Sierra de la Muela Mountains creates a captivating backdrop, inviting visitors to immerse themselves in its natural beauty and experience a serene ambience like no other. While most visitors are drawn to Isla Plana for its peaceful atmosphere and scenic vistas, a select few seek out this hidden paradise for a unique adventure to explore the mesmerizing depths of Cueve del Agua. This very allure of the warm waters within the cave also gives rise to its unpredictable and dangerous conditions. Several people have lost their lives in this cave because of its technical nature due to its geomorphological characteristics, which makes it a challenge for even the most advanced cave diving enthusiasts. In the beginning of the 90s, two French divers died in this cave. The causes of the accident are unknown. Their remains were not found until several years later by other divers passing by. Surprisingly, this incident did not discourage others from attempting to conquer the cave. Its seductive power is such that, according to local residents, every weekend there are excursions of divers who only seek to overcome the challenge of going through its galleries and coming out from them to be able to tell the tale. In subsequent years, two additional disasters unfolded in a similar fashion. The tales of these incidents shed light on the true dangers of the cave. This is the Cuave del Agua cave disaster of 1996. Located along the margins of a regional road and seemingly abandoned, Cuave del Agua is a hidden gem that demands keen observation to notice its existence. With scarce signage to guide the way, it requires heightened awareness to recognize its hollow black opening. If the traveler were to look into this opening by chance, he would discover a narrow slope that leads to the main entrance of one of the most interesting underwater caves in Spain. Located in the town of Isla Plana, on the shores of Mergier's Costa Calida, the Cueve del Agua began to be explored in the 1970s and currently has 6,956 meters or 22,825 feet of explored route. The approximate linear length of the cave is about 900 meters, 2,953 feet. Its turquoise thermal waters, which remain at a temperature of more than 30 degrees throughout the year, is an attractive natural pool for the locals to bask in. Experts believe that the unexplored section of the cave connects with the mountains surrounding the coastal towns. Geologically, it makes perfect sense, says Sergio Peris, one of the pioneers in the exploration of the Cueva de Agua. Its entrance is located at the edge of the main road, at the height of El Mahon, and has two sectors, a short one that continues towards the sea, and another, the most extensive, which goes under the mountain, about 1,000 meters, or 3,281 feet. At the end of this section, and after overcoming a narrow labyrinth of galleries, the spring from which the thermal waters flow was found. Cueve de Agua is a huge labyrinth of warm water galleries and chambers, known as Europe Cenote. The very warm, almost still water has resulted in very silty and muddy sections. In fact, some of the passages were cleared with shovels by the early explorers. The entrance cavern zone is suitable for novice cave divers, but deeper exploration is serious and requires solid cave diving skills. Thus, this is why this cave is frequently used for advanced cave diver training. The current explorers and divers of the Cueva de Agua group are trying to explore the cave in depth, following two lines of research. One is to try to find out more about the hydrothermal origin of the cave and to observe the development of the fractures that connect the aquifer with the cavities. Another line is to investigate why the levels of the aquifers of the coast of the region are dropping. On March 29th, 1996, a team of Garda civil divers set out to coordinate a cave diving course in Cueva de Agua. The Guardia Civil is the oldest law enforcement agency in Spain and is one of two national police forces. 
The GEAS is the specialized unit of the Guardia Civil in charge of search and rescue of people, location and recovery of objects in the aquatic environments, among other missions. The team meticulously conducted their equipment checks and reviewed the plan, leaving no room for error. Antonio Naringo Soler and Antonio Sanchez Lopez Gajaro were chosen as the first dive pair, with a pair of support divers stationed at the entrance, ready to assist if needed. The plan for the first dive was very relaxed, as the GEAS divers were testing new equipment and sought to avoid tempting fate. The pair intended to dive one third of the gas, or the second jump of the gallery tube pool about 200 meters from the entrance. Whichever came first was going to be the trigger to return to the surface. Antonio Naringo Soler and Antonio Sanchez Lopez Gajaro began their swim from the entrance. The speed of the dive was very slow paced. Admiring the shapes, feeling the behavior of the new test equipment and enjoying the relaxation that comes with not only from diving in caves, but also from diving in thermal water at 28 degrees Celsius. After covering 75 meters or 246 feet, the pair reached the gallery of distress. This section posed a challenge as they navigated through narrow passages with sediment laden bottoms, encountering occasional disruptions in the line due to collapses. After approximately 4 meters or 12 feet of traversing galleries, they entered the expansive and cavernous galley of Discord, which offered multiple potential routes, but those were reserved for later exploration. Within 6 meters or 20 more feet of diving, they found themselves in the pool tube located at 185 meters or 607 feet, indicating that they were nearing the end of their intended route. After about 15 more meters or 49 feet, the pair reached the second T-junction, catching a glimpse of the initial section of the viscera gallery. However, despite having 20 bars of gas remaining for the return journey and more than two minutes left before the designated return time, they reached the end of the marking line. The conditions allowed for a slight extension of this line, and for a brief moment, their eyes gleamed with excitement and a longing gaze, silently contemplating if the other would break the pact and suggest venturing further. Yet, a profound gaze exchanged between them signaled the lowering of their brows, an acceptance of resignation, and the commencement of their return. At a depth of 210 meters, or 689 feet, the pair decided to turn the dive when a sudden wave of horror washed over their faces. The tranquil blue waters they had initially encountered were now transformed into a murky haze, clouded with silt that had been stirred up from the galleries during their descent. Even the slightest disturbance caused by the exhaled air bubbles of the divers as they collide with the ceiling of the cavity dislodges fragments of rocks and stones of varying sizes. This, in turn, contributed to the increased turbidity of the water, both above and below the divers, severely hampering their visibility and making it challenging to locate the exit. The diminished visibility added to an unsettling element to their underwater experience, heightening the tension and unease in their hearts. On their return along the viscera line, the first fatal mistake was made by the pair at this crucial junction located at 200 meters or 656 feet. They turned right here instead of left towards the entrance. It is said that the dense silt in the water caused the pair to lose their sense of direction. After swimming in the wrong direction for approximately 10 minutes, the pair unexpectedly arrived at the entrance of a narrow passage that led into the Gallery della Cera. At this point, the pair must now have been struck with a realization that they had committed a critical error. Drawing upon their knowledge and calculations, they understood that they should have been traversing the extensive passage of galleries that would ultimately lead them back to the pool of tubes at 185 meters to make the jump back to the gallery of discord line. In a truly bewildering turn of events, instead of turning back to rectify their mistake, the pair inexplicably chose to press forward fueled by the hope of discovering an alternative exit. This would be the second crucial mistake made by the pair. This decision, which defied logic, 
was said to be acted upon desperation as their air supply began to dwindle to critical levels. Finally navigating through the narrow passage, Antonio Narenjo Solia and Antonio Sanchez Lopez Gajaro found themselves at a depth of 250 meters, or approximately 820 feet, still with only a few inches of visibility in front of their masks. Desperately searching for a glimmer of light that might indicate an exit, their hopes were diminished as the cave offered nothing but murky, silted out water. After persisting in the wrong direction for approximately 15 more minutes, the pair eventually reached the end of the line. No other connections or pathways were present, leaving them with a profound sense of isolation and despair. With a mere five minutes of air supply remaining, the pair was left with no other choice but to turn back, accepting the harsh reality that no alternative options were available. They retraced their steps, diligently following the Galleria de Chera line back for a distance of 50 meters, or approximately 164 feet. Antonio Narenjo Soler cast a desperate glance backward, only to witness Antonio Sanchez Lopez Gajaro's flashlight rapidly fading into the murky abyss. Antonio Sanchez Lopez Gajaro had succumbed to the effect of insufficient air, causing him to lose consciousness. With a heavy heart, Antonio Naranjo Soler realized it was now only a matter of time before he too would face the same fate. In a final act of determination, he managed to swim an additional 10 meters, or approximately 33 feet, before succumbing to unconsciousness and tragically drowning. After one hour had passed, the pair of support divers from GEAS, who had been on standby at the surface, received instructions to descend and initiate a search for the missing divers. Recognizing the urgency and the gravity of the situation, the support divers swiftly took action to prepare their equipment and conduct thorough checks. But they could not advance more than 30 meters or 98 feet due to the turbidity. As the minutes passed and the two civil guards gave no sign of life, hopes for a happy outcome began to dim, as did the cave itself. Night fell in the midst of an impressive deployment of troops, but to no avail. The first search operation, improvised and extremely risky, were suspended without results. The rescue work did not stop day or night, and although in the first hours, even in the first few days, there was a faint glimmer of hope that they may have found an air bubble between the water and the ceiling of the cave, the passing of days finally extinguished it definitively. The government delegate took charge of organizing an impressive rescue operation, mobilizing a diverse team of experts and professionals. The operation included highly skilled divers from the Garda Civil and the Navy Diving Center, experienced underwater speleologists, members of civil protection, and other specialized organizations dedicated to such operations. The scale of the rescue effort was further amplified by the involvement of divers from various cities across Spain, showcasing the collaborative spirit and collective determination of those involved. It took the best specialists in Spain a painstaking 35 days to locate the bodies. On May the 1st, 1996, 34 days after the accident and after uninterrupted work, the lifeless body of Lieutenant Naranjo was found 195 meters or 640 feet from the mouth of the cave. And the following day, the body of the guard, Antonio Sanchez, was found 95 meters or 311 feet from the entrance to the same gallery, both in an advanced state of decomposition due to the high temperature of the water. All of the media followed the incidents of the rescue with extensive information and photographs of the entrance of the cave. The tragic deaths of the GEAS divers and the French diver who had ventured into the cave two decades earlier, never to resurface, prompted the authorities to take immediate action. Warning signs were installed at the mouth of the cave, serving as a solemn reminder of the perilous nature of the underwater labyrinth. In an effort to enhance safety measures, the administration also erected a fence to restrict access. However, the resolve of some individuals to challenge the dangers proved stronger than the physical barriers resulting in the chains of the fence being broken by those who were willing to take the risk and venture into the cave. 
disregarding the potential consequences to their own lives. With the short-lived fences, it was only a matter of time before tragedy struck again. This prophecy came to fruition 14 years later, as another incident unfolded within the cave's depths. Antonio Pedro Martinez Ardes, a 41-year-old married man and employee of the Casco Antiguo diving establishment in Murcia, found himself trapped inside the labyrinth depths of the cave. Despite his best efforts, he could not locate the path to freedom. It was already well past the dive time limit allowed by his tanks when his companions dialed for emergency services. When the highly skilled specialists from the GEAS arrived at the scene, a haunting sense of deja vu gripped their hearts. Memories of the tragic search for their two lost comrades 14 years ago resurfaced. Determined to rescue Antonio, two GEAS agents swiftly geared up and plunged into the water. However, they found that it was impossible to read even the watches on their wrists. Reluctantly, they had no choice but to retreat, and the search was called off. The following morning, the GEAS diving experts, who had arrived from Madrid the previous night, commenced a renewed search operation. As the settling mud offered a glimmer of clarity, the team delved once more into the treacherous depths of the cave. They held onto the possibility of a miracle, yearning to discover Antonio sheltered in an air pocket, ready to be guided towards the exit. Unfortunately, that would not be the case, and Cuava de Agro now had the death toll of four victims. In the wake of the fourth fatality in 2010, commemorative plaques were erected near the entrance of the cave as a tribute to the victims. A dedicated group of researchers and explorers remained adamant in their belief that the cave should be regarded as a realm of scientific discovery, emphasizing the importance of preserving its integrity rather than promoting it for tourism purposes. Currently, the cave is still being explored by a group of cave divers from the region of Mergia, called Grupo Cuava del Agua Limet 10,000, which has surveyed 6,956 meters or 22,825 feet of galleries, and whose objective is to connect it with a network of nearby caves and chasms to reach 10,000 meters or 32,808 feet. Imagine the bone-chilling realization of being trapped in an unknown cave, where darkness and cold seem to be the only constant variables. A place where solace is but a distant memory, replaced only by the lifeless body of a once-cherished friend. In the breathtaking region of the Cap de la Barra, Spain, an unforeseen tragedy began to unfold approximately a decade ago. Ricardo and Dionisio, two fearless souls bound by a shared passion for exploration, embark on their most challenging adventure yet, oblivious to the impending dangers that lay ahead. This is their story and the Cove de Arquette's disaster of 2014. Approximately 80 meters or 262 feet in length, Cove de Arquette's is a limestone cave located in the Mongerie area. It is a popular destination among underwater photography enthusiasts and attracts numerous divers due to its accessibility and good visibility making it a common dive site for locals. From Lestartit, you can go by car to Plaza de Molinier. From there, it is necessary to get into the water and swim in a north direction, following the wall of the coast. Once you arrive at Ponte del Zalquette, you will have to start the dive and continue on for another 50 to 60 meters following the bottom marine, until you find the entrance mouth. The entrance descends approximately 10 meters, or 33 feet beneath the surface of the sea. The mouth is an opening of about 2.5 meters or 8 feet that gives passage to an ascending conduit with the ground filled with stones and going up to 4 meters or 13 feet. The cave extends to a depth of approximately 40 meters or 131 feet and is usually considered manageable for experienced divers. Despite its reputation as a relatively straightforward dive, Experts studying the cave have discovered an intriguing aspect. Towards its end, there is a small opening leading to a muddy cavity. 
Interestingly, there had been no known record of anyone successfully passing through this opening. Due to its obscurity and the potential absence of visibility, depending on sea conditions. For a considerable period, Cova del Zarquets remained a well-kept secret among a select group of divers who frequented the coast of Les Astet. However, the cave's existence couldn't stay hidden for long. As the sun illuminated the azure waters, casting a shimmering reflection upon their adventurous spirits, the group of four friends set sail from the port of Les Astrettes on that fateful morning of Saturday, July the 19th, 2014. Their camaraderie and love for exploration propelled them forward towards the mesmerizing allure of Cap de la Barre, a remarkable cliff formation formed during the separation of the Medes Islands from the mainland thousands of years ago. Hidden beneath the surface, an intricate maze of underwater cavities awaited their discovery, shaped by the same tectonic forces that sculptured the majestic cliff. Undaunted by the potential perils that lay ahead, three of the friends, Ricard, Denisio, and a companion whose identity remains unspoken, excitedly geared up in their diving equipment and prepared to plunge into the mysteries of the submerged realm. Meanwhile, the fourth member of the group stood watchfully on the surface, shouldering the crucial responsibility of ensuring their safety during this daring expedition. Continuing their dive without the aid of ropes or any visible markers, the trio courageously entered and exited several underwater caves. Each cave held its own unique beauty, adorned with intricately patterned stones and a diverse array of marine life. Among their discoveries, they found themselves facing the entrance of the Cove de Arquettes, commonly known as the Cave of the Lobsters. The entrance descended approximately 10 meters or 33 feet beneath the surface of the sea, presenting them with an intriguing opportunity for further exploration. With the artificial light of their flashlights, Ricard, Denisa, and their buddy diver traveled 45 meters or 148 feet underground and under the sea. This stretch of rock in the Arquette's cave is ideal for recruiting lobsters, hence its second name. But when the rock ends, the grotto changes texture. The rock gives way, from which point clay and narrow, unexplored territory begins. Their buddy diver began to feel overwhelmed by fear. Through a series of gestures, he communicated his decision to return to the surface. Respecting his choice, Ricardo and Denisio shared a mutual understanding and decided to carry on without him, a mistake that would prove fatal. Ricardo and Denisio swam onward, covering an additional distance of 35 meters or 115 feet along the seabed. With each kick of their flippers, their visibility seemed to diminish. They pressed on regardless, determined to explore further. As they reached a distance of 80 meters or 262 feet, the duo made the mutual decision that it was time to conclude their dive. However, an unforeseen challenge awaited them. The silt in the water had caused them to lose their sense of direction entirely. Their movements across the seabed stirred up the sediment, transforming the water into a murky haze. Unbeknownst to them, their progress had inadvertently created a dense cloud of mud-filled water, effectively erecting a disorientating black wall behind them. The path they had taken was now obscured, shrouded in an impenetrable darkness. Devoid of any visual markers or lines to guide them, Ricard and Denisio found themselves in a desperate predicament, with no clear path to escape. The weight of their situation intensified as they realized their limited air supply reaching critical levels within their diving tanks. The search for an exit became an agonizing race against time. Amidst their despair, a glimmer of hope emerged as they caught sight of a hairline crack in the ceiling above. The faintest hint of light seeped through, beckoning them to investigate further. Fueled by a combination of desperation and determination, they swam toward the crack, their hearts pounding with anticipation. In a daring act of desperation, Ricard and Denisio made a risky gamble, deciding to squeeze through the unknown crack, oblivious to where it would lead them. 
the narrow passage pressed tightly against their chests and backs as they advanced. With each inch gained, uncertainty looped, and the possibility of a dead end that would seal their fate by suffocation weighed heavily upon them. The passage went diagonally upwards towards the surface and was 80 meters or 262 feet from the cave entrance. It led them to a subway lake, a bubble of breathable air, a pocket of oxygen that seemed to have been waiting for them for centuries. The pair removed their equipment and with their heads out of the water and their bodies partially submerged, Ricard and Denisio felt as if they had just cheated certain death. The pair seized the opportunity to commemorate the miraculous escape, capturing the incredible turn of events in a couple of photographs. One image with Ricard, his face beaming with a mix of relief and exhilaration. The other portrayed Denisio, his expression mirroring a mixture of gratitude and disbelief. They found solace and a renewed sense of humor in the unexpected surprise that awaited the GEAS rescue divers, who would discover them alive upon their recovery. Or so they believed. As hours ticked by, concern grew among Ricard and Denisio's companions on the surface. The GEAS of Les Cartet was on duty that morning, providing security for open water swimmers participating in a popular crossing in Capta Cruz. Around 11 o'clock in the morning, a distress call reached the team from Ricard and Denisio's two worried friends. Corporal Fernando Aguirre, the GEAS group leader, swiftly organized the team for an immediate return trip to the dive site before nightfall. Although they held little hope, they understood that the air in Ricard and Denisio's cylinders would have likely depleted by now, leading to a tragic drowning. Unbeknownst to those on the surface, Ricard and Denisio remained trapped within the air pocket they had discovered. The bubble, measuring approximately 30 square meters, with a height of 1.5 meters, seemed like a sanctuary in the midst of their ordeal. It contained a substantial amount of air, estimated to be around 35,000 liters. However, their prolonged presence within the confined space had dire consequences. The act of breathing, vital as it was, had gradually filled the limited airspace with carbon dioxide. Unbeknownst to them, this invisible gas was silently and insidiously poisoning their bodies, jeopardizing their survival in the very refuge they had sought. As time wore on, the rising levels of CO2 within the air pocket began to take its toll. The once life-giving oxygen was gradually being replaced by this toxic byproduct of breathing. Ricard and Denisio, now realizing the impending danger, felt the insidious effects of the poisonous gas infiltrating their bodies impairing their cognitive and physical functions. As the relentless passing of time wore on, the plight of Ricard and Denisio grew increasingly dire. Dehydration, disorientation, and hypothermia took a heavy toll on their weakened bodies, exacerbating their already challenging circumstances. However, it was Ricard who bore the brunt of the carbon dioxide's effects, experiencing its debilitating impact more severely than Denisio. Their once vibrant spirits had all been extinguished, replaced by a somber resignation to their grim fate. In their struggle to stay afloat, Ricard's strength waned further, making it increasingly difficult for him to keep his head above the water's surface. Denisio cast a worried glance toward Ricard, only to witness the sight of his body, almost lifeless, slipping into the water. A surge of adrenaline coursed through Denisio's veins as he summoned every ounce of his remaining strength. With a valiant effort, he managed to seize Ricard and pull his head back above the water's surface, fighting against the inevitable doom that loomed over them. As five more excruciating hours crawled by, the relentless toll on Ricard and Denisio's bodies reached a devastating climax. With the air in their tanks dwindled to nothing and the water still silt-laden, a suffocating dread took hold. The air pocket, the very element that once sustained them was now becoming their silent executioner. Cognitive and physical paralysis gripped them, rendering them helpless in the face of their impending doom. Ricard's weakened body began slipping into the water once more, no longer under his control. In a heart-wrenching moment of despair, Denisio, himself drained of every ounce of strength, could do nothing but watch as the lifeless body of his friend submerged into the depths below. With a heavy heart, Denisio found himself alone, 
his own survival hanging by a thread. He had exhausted every last reserve of energy, leaving him with no means to keep his head above water any longer, and he was now certain that he would die as well. As the clock struck five in the evening, Agur, the esteemed leader of the GEAS, entered the cave accompanied by a fellow diver. With unwavering determination, they ventured into the depths of the cave, braving the challenging and rocky terrain that lay before them. Swimming a distance of 45 meters, or 148 feet, they pushed forward, propelled by a relentless pursuit to locate Ricard and Denisio. Their progress, however, was abruptly impeded as they encountered the murky aftermath of the frantic disturbance caused by the trapped victims. The swirling sediment obscured their vision, cast an eerie veil of uncertainty, preventing them from advancing further or discerning the path that Ricard and Denisio had taken in their desperate escape. During the night, the corporal activated the Garda Civil's National Speedio Diving Group. Aguirre, in preparation for the rescue, had called biologists, diving centers, underwater photographers and fishermen in the last few hours. None of them knew much about the cave. The only one who provided a basic topography was a biologist, a precarious map that ended in the muddy terrain that Aguirre had just entered. The search was reactivated on Sunday, and by this time no one believed in the possibility of finding them alive. Coming from Valladolid, Huesca, Valdemoro, Cartagena and Barcelona, the specialists activated by the corporal arrived at Lestartit in the early hours of the morning. The incident was now public, and that second day was followed by dozens of journalists from the port. Clinging to the line that Aguirre and his partner had set up the day before, the first two divers of the morning reached the clay area. Visibility was good again. During the night, the mud had settled and the fissure through which Ricard and Denisio had fled was visible. It seemed plausible that Ricard and Denisio had slipped through there. The diver who first entered the fissure would declare in the subsequent report that, after a few minutes, and given that the narrowness was so pronounced, he tried to turn around to go back, but realized that it was impossible and that he could only go forward. He did so and finally reached the bubble that Ricard and Denisio had found. The civil guard emerged in that subway lake swept the cavity with his flashlight and discovered Ricard's lifeless body floating inside his neoprene and Denisio against the wall, clinging to the rock with both hands, with half his body out of the water, emitting a moan of agony through which he exhaled the last breath he had left. He was dying, but he was still alive. Completely stunned, Denisio was disorientated, dehydrated, hypothermic and breathing very hard. He would not even allow himself to be fitted with air equipment. The policeman had to give him oxygen by emptying several bottles in front of his face that they had brought on various trips. Afterwards, they gave him isotonic drinks. The most difficult part remained, to convince him to follow them, to put his head back under the water and let them guide him. But Denisio, who did not understand anything, who did not know where he was, who did not know his rescuers, refused to collaborate. Aguirre took the delicate decision to convince one of Denisio's diving friends to agree to go into the cave and reach the bubble following the line installation, a plan that consisted of seducing Denisio with a familiar face and that succeeded in diffusing the only alternative they had left, sedating Denisio. On Sunday afternoon, Denisio, encouraged by his friend and escorted by the GEAS, surfaced off Cap de la Barra after 24 hours and became the first diver to survive such an accident in Spain. Ricard's body was later recovered. Corporal Aguirre conducted a three-year investigation into these events and concluded that Ricard had died as a result of hypercapnia. Hypercapnia, also known as hypercarbia, is a condition that occurs when a person has too much carbon dioxide in their bloodstream, which in severe cases causes death as seen in Ricard's case. The report also specifies that both divers did not have the necessary training and took too many risks, especially because they were diving without thread installation. When it was published that there was an investigation underway that contemplated all the hypotheses, 
as is done whenever someone dies, rumors spread about the responsibility of Denisio in what happened, or about a hypothetical lack of help to Ricard. The report, however, ended up reflecting that Denisio tried twice to save Ricard, dragging him back into the fissure when he saw him vanish. Two unsuccessful attempts that were recorded on their dive computers. Denisio did not want to make statements to El Periodico. As those involved reflect on the haunting event that unfolded in the Cove de la Arquettes in 2014, a shiver runs down their spines, reminding them of the chilling desolation and profound sense of isolation that gripped Ricard and Denisio. Located in the southeastern region of the Northern Range in Trinidad, the Kumarka Cave system is a vast network of caverns formed by the river that flows through it. From small to massive, these caverns reach deep into the mountainside, with many remaining largely unexplored. It was the lure of a rumored secret cavern that drew the British Sub Aqua Club to the site, but for two young members of the team, their curiosity and overconfidence proved to be their downfall. This is the tragic tale of the Kumarka Cave Disaster of 1964. It was March the 22nd in the year of 1964. Hans Booz was a mere 25 years old, having been a member of the Trinidad and Tobago Field Naturalist Club for about four years, when on the calendar of activities, there was a planned trip to the Kumarka Caves in Plantinal, deep in the Northern Ridge. Here, the largest colony of Gucharos, or oil birds, Stetornis catrapentis, are said to still exist in large numbers. The caves were accessible only by foot, passing through the numerous old cocoa estates that once belonged to the Leotold family. So, on that fateful day, along with his younger brother, Julius Boos, in a convoy of cars carrying other members and friends of the club, they drove slowly up the nine miles of torturous road to the Plantinal Valley. Parking at the side of the road where a smaller dirt patch led upwards to the hillside, it became apparent that the Field Naturalist Club was not the only entity which had planned to go in the caves that day. Unloading their cars and vans were the members of the local branch of the British Sub Aqua Club. One of their members, Vincent Abraham, happened to be both a member of the British Sub Aqua Club and the Trinidad and Tobago Field Naturalist Club, and he explained that the happy circumstances that brought them together were totally unplanned. The Sub Aqua Club had been diving on the site where the Spanish Admiral Apodaca had burnt and scuttled his ships at their anchorage of the island of Gaspar. The Sub Aqua Club had then decided to do some caving in the only cave that lent itself to this sort of underwater exploration and to attempt to put rest of old legend that there were other inner caves a short swim from the emergence of the Kubarka River in the depths of the cave. The legends of these inner caves arose from a rumor that an ancient, a merry Indian had made the swim and came back to tell the tale, which was confirmed by a US soldier posted to Trinidad during World War II. He is said to have made the swim too, and in those days, there was no sophisticated underwater gear at hand. It is speculated that he had a pair of swimming goggles to make the swim, as the now familiar face mask and scuba gear were certainly not available at that time but there was enough optimism rising from the stories and from the experiences of the British that there would be little trouble in either finding this fabled underwater cavern or dispelling the myth forever. Perhaps it was this optimism and devil-may-care attitude that was to result in the tragic events that would unfold later in the day. After about an hour or so walking, the Field Naturalist Club arrived at the old estate buildings a row of wooden shacks, along with quarters for the workers of the almost now defunct estate. As the naturalist club prepared themselves for the hike into the cave itself, they were giving guidelines for their safety on entering the cave by the workers and told what to expect and the do's and don'ts concerning the flashlights that startled the oil birds. The sub aqua club had set off before the naturalist club and was nowhere to be seen as they arrived at the entrance to the cave. 
a large angled fissure in a cliff face. One by one, Hans, his brother Julius, and the rest of the naturalist club stepped into the shallow river and waded into the darkness of the cave. They could hear the earthly screeches up in the darkness ahead, and as they got deeper and deeper into the cave, this devilish squalling became progressively louder as it grew darker and the club's flashlights had to light the way with every step. Overhead, the birds were rushing about in the light, piercing the darkness, and a constant drizzle of bird urine and droppings began to rain down. Added to that, they were sure that they heard some bats too, as they could see their dark shapes fluttering about above their heads. On the banks of the river, there were huge piles of bird and bat guano, accumulated over the years. Guano is the accumulated excrement of birds or bats, and on this guano, black and smelly stunted forest palm seedlings were growing, all reaching upward like ghosts to a non-existent light. Without the light to begin the process of photosynthesis, they would grow only until they had exhausted their supply of food in the seed, and then they would die, or be eaten by the swarms of cockroaches, millipedes, and other cave anthropod fauna that scuttled away from the club's lights. Having now accomplished the first goal of their trip, which was to see the rare and curious birds, the Trinidad and Tobago Naturalist Club set off to accomplish the second, which was to attempt to net the rare blind catfish, which is found only in this cave. This extremely rare fish was considered a prize catch for aquarists. There are areas of the cave where only people who do not suffer from claustrophobia can attempt to pass further into the inner chambers. One must wade through almost chest-high water and hold one's head at right angles to the body to be able to breathe to pass under a low shelf of rock formation before emerging into the larger chamber beyond. As a number of the naturalist club emerged into this last chamber, they found the sub-aqua club there and they were informed that a pair of divers, more experienced men from the British contingent, had already started their exploratory dive. The plan was to carry a roll of measuring tape in as far as they could swim for a half-life of the tanks of air, and then they would drop the roll and swim back, following the tape to the point of departure. The British Subaqua Club and the Naturalist Club members gathered around, with their eyes fixed on the tape disappearing into the dark water, which flowed out from under the wall of the cave, where there was an underwater passage that led downwards to who knew where. As the two sub aqua club members began the descent into the underwater passage, spirits were high. But things did not look so promising as the water flowing out was murky with stirred up sediment. About 20 minutes later, the two men emerged from the hole and pulling off their mask, they gasped in relief in the open air. Immediately, they began to explain how dangerous they had found the going in and even more so the coming back out where they stirred up wake both from the action of the swimming and also from the trail of expelled air, which, as they breathed, had disrupted years of the fine sediments from the surrounding rocks, walls and roofs. They were not so aware of this as they were going in, as they were swimming into the current, but when they turned to come back after dropping the roll of tape, they were faced with a wall of thick, impenetrable, silt-laden water, with visibility at almost zero, making it difficult to see the tape much less the way out. The two divers had managed to follow the tape in the murk and merge only minutes before their air ran out. They advised that due to the danger, the mission should be aborted until they had better equipment, especially lights to see underwater. The sub-aqua club were using flashlights made waterproof by being wrapped in plastic bags, and there were no safety lines that they could attach to their bodies for retrieval in events as described by the first two divers. But the local Trinidadian contingent began to protest that they had not come down so far to give up so easily and so, against the advice of the most experienced divers, two local young men, Vincent Abraham and Adam Richards, prepared to make a second attempt, at least to get as far as the drop tape, for they could see that the water was clearing up as the silt was washed out and perhaps began to settle. Vincent and Adam began to gear up for the dive when Vincent came to Hans' brother, Julius, 
and asked if he could borrow the small jackknife he could see hanging on Julius's belt. Julius readily lent him the knife and the slim leather belt, and as the two young men slipped into the water, Vincent made a jest, imitating the famous Jerry Lewis diving posture, saying merrily, Goodbye, cruel world. How prophetic these words proved to be. The water immediately clouded up again, and a sinking feeling immediately set in the stomachs of the club members watching from above. The Trinidad and Tobago Naturalist Club, who had come to attempt to catch at the catfish, moved out of the chamber and made their way downstream, going towards the entrance of the cave to see if the silt would have settled out by then and allowing them to bait the fish from the hiding and to net them. In the excitement of the next hours, Hans gave up on the prospect of catching the fish as he strained his back coming into the cave and the pain was such that the only thing he wanted to do was get back to the cars and then home. As Adam Richards and Vincent Abraham swam deeper into the unknown passage, they realized why the previous divers had warned them against entering. The crumbling rock formations made it increasingly difficult to see. Despite this, the two were determined to find the secret cavern, or at least reach the end of the previously laid sport, and continued their dive. The pair continued their dive until they reached a depth of 100 meters, or 328 feet where the end of the spool was located. The two divers communicated with each other through signals, indicating their desire to continue deeper into the cave in search of the hidden underwater cavern, at which point the brittle ceiling of the cave suddenly collapsed, trapping Adam under piles of rock and debris. Vincent panicked and attempted to move the boulders, but his efforts only caused more of the surrounding formations to crumble. Adam's lifeless body lay there entirely covered with rocks. With no other options left, Vincent knew that he had to swim back to the surface to get help. However, the rockfall had caused the water to become filled with thick, impenetrable silt, and Vincent could not see more than a few inches in front of his mask. Without the line visible, Vincent had to rely purely on intuition and hoped that he was swimming in the right direction. Vincent had been swimming for 15 minutes, hoping that he was following the correct path. His anxiety grew with every stroke as he monitored his tanks and realized that he was running out of air. The trail of expelled air continued to disrupt the sediment that had formed on the walls for hundreds of years. He knew that he had to emerge on the other side of the silt, so he swam vigorously, hoping to break through and find the exit. But to his dismay, there was no exit to be found. Vincent had swum in the wrong direction, and he now found himself in a pitch black void, completely devoid of any light. Despite the overwhelming sense of dread, Vincent did not panic. He was already feeling the effects of nitrogen narcosis, which was taking over his bodily functions and controlling his thoughts and movements. Instead of trying to find an exit, he started to undress himself. Slowly, he removed his mask, wetsuit, and one flipper before finally removing his regulator. In the inky darkness, he allowed himself to sink into the abyss, accepting his fate and letting go of the struggle. As Hans and Julius made their way up the slippery slopes of the hills out of the valley, suddenly they heard the sound of running feet and one of the sub-aqua members run past them as if the devil was at his heels. He ignored their cause of inquiry a few minutes after another man, this time an Englishman, came running and paused only long enough to tell them breathlessly that they had lost two men. The Englishman, Louis Walsh, shrieked out, they went in and did not come out, and that they were going to get more air tanks from their cars to continue the rescue efforts, as all the air they had in the cave had already been used up by the search. Members of the Naturalist Club wanted to go back to help in these efforts, but Hans dissuaded them on the grounds that more people in the crowded cave certainly would escalate the danger level, and that their flashlight batteries were almost exhausted anyhow, so it would be folly to track back into the cave. Hans exclaimed to the group that the best thing they could do was to hurry to the Arima police station and make a report, and that he knew a professional diver who he would try to contact when they get to a phone. A while later, the two men came running back, grey-faced with exhaustion, 
and carrying fresh tanks of air to enable them to continue the search for the missing men. About an hour later, Hans made the report to the police at a Rima station from the little information he had, and then headed to the home of John Dunstan, who lived on the outskirts of Arima, using his phone to try and contact Malcolm Brown, who was an old field diver of some experience. It took quite a while before Hans managed to get in contact with Malcolm. He was attending a Southern Games, a yearly popular sports event held at Gurakea Park in Pointe-à-Pierre. Hans explained the situation to him as best he could, and Malcolm told him that he would try his best to assemble a team and equipment and rendezvous at the Arima police station, where he expected he could get more current news of the status of the developing tragedy. At the Arima police station where, by then, word had spread to the families of the missing men, they were gathered in a group outside the station, where there was speculation as to what had happened, and there was some hope that the two men had found the fabled inner cave, or at least a pocket of air, and were there awaiting their rescue. As Hans could do little more, he left for home. Upon reaching the entrance of the Kumarka cave, Malcolm Brown and his brother, accompanied by a team of helpers and several donkeys, carrying the necessary equipment, which included powerful lights and safety harnesses, prepared for the hazardous dive ahead. As the rescue team stepped into the dark trail, they carefully maneuvered themselves and equipment under the low shelf formations before emerging in the last chamber where they found the British Sub Aqua Club in total disarray. Ethan Schwartz warmly greeted Malcolm Brown and his team before providing them with an overview of the situation. After receiving all the necessary details, Malcolm and his brother then began to prepare their diving equipment for their descent into the unknown passage. With Malcolm in the lead, the pair began the rescue mission, fully aware that they had no idea what awaited them in the depths. As they swam past boulders and rocky formations, they had to be extremely careful, making sure not to touch or bump into anything that might cause the walls to crumble further or send debris cascading down onto them. The sound of their breathing echoed through the passage as they pushed forward, the water becoming increasingly colder and darker as they descended further. Upon reaching a depth of 100 meters, or 328 feet, Malcolm and his brother noticed a roll of tape that had been dropped by the Sub Aqua Club during their initial descent. However, upon closer inspection, they discovered that the tape was defective, having been broken and haphazardly taped back together with what appeared to be common sellotape. Unfortunately, the water had softened the joint, causing the tape to come apart, rendering it useless. Even if the two lost divers had managed to locate the spool, it would have led them nowhere, adding to the already perilous situation. After scanning the area further, Malcolm noticed an immense amount of fallen rocks and boulders on the floor of the passage. His intuition told him that this was not just a coincidence and that something had caused the rockfall. He signaled to his brother to stop and inspected the rocks more closely. It was at this moment when Malcolm's heart sank as he noticed the lifeless body of Adam Richards buried under the heap of rubble. With only one arm, leg and tank visible in the murky waters, it was clear that Richards had suffered a fatal accident and had been trapped under the fallen rocks for some time. Realizing that moving the rocks could cause further damage to the already unstable cave structure, Malcolm and his brother decided to carefully take note of where they found Adam's body and continued their search for Vincent Abraham. As Malcolm and his brother ventured deeper into the passage, reaching a depth of 160 meters or 525 feet, Malcolm's attention was drawn to a glimmer in the murky waters. Upon closer inspection, he identified it as a flipper, still attached to the body of Vincent Abraham. The sight of Vincent's naked body with only one flipper left them struck with disbelief. With Vincent's body safely secured in a body bag, Malcolm and his brother began their ascent to the surface. However, they were about to discover the true danger of the cave. As they reached a depth of 75 meters or 246 feet, the ceiling suddenly began to crumble without any warning. The already murky waters became even more silt laden, 
making it difficult for them to see and find the line they had laid upon entering the cave. Their flashlights were of no use as they desperately searched for the exit. It felt like an eternity, but finally Malcolm's brother was able to find the line in the silt and they clung to it for dear life, hoping it had not been moved and would lead them out. The cave continued to crumble as they made their way upwards, passing depths of 60 meters, 50 meters, and 40 meters. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, the brothers emerged into the large chamber where the sub aqua club members had been anxiously waiting for any news. With a deep sense of relief, the Brown brothers expressed their gratitude for being out of the treacherous cave. They reiterated to the members of the sub aqua club what they already knew. The passage they had ventured into was incredibly hazardous, with walls that crumbled without warning. They shared the news of Vincent's body, which they had brought up from the depths, and informed them about Adam's trapped body, which proved too dangerous to retrieve. When he told Adam's father, who had travelled into the cave that night, what he found of his son, the elder Richards had pragmatically reasoned, in that Adam was dead and virtually buried already and it was not wise to risk any more lives to reach the body. In those years, the daily newspapers were not published on a Monday, but that Tuesday, the 24th, there was maximum coverage of the tragedy, where more details and photos were given of the rescue efforts, and how though they had recovered the body of Victor. The headline screamed, Nightmare Death Pool at Coup Marker, among other sensational sentences, and even a week later, the Sunday Guardian bannered, chambers of horrors in picturesque countryside. It is a strange passing how this event has touched Han Boo's family. Several years later, his cousin Nigel Boo's was hiking in the same river near the entrance of the cave when he stumbled upon a bone that he suspected to be human. He immediately sent it to Sir Henry Pierre, a well-known Trinidadian surgeon, who identified it as a tibula or a human leg bone. Considering all other coincidences, it was highly probable that this bone belonged to Adam Richards. The cave was giving up its dead. This has been Gripping Horror. I hope to see you in the next one.